Thank you, Haley, and I hope that everyone enjoyed the morning session or the session earlier with Erica and team, Erica and Allison from the tech. Uh, I think I also found it very interesting and I'm really excited about what I built as well. So thank you both for that activity as well as all of the information that you provided. So on when we talked to, when we spoke on, um, I believe it was, gosh, I can't remember in the last training when we had, I think it was Monday, it was Monday, correct? Um, when we spoke on Monday, we talked about STEM pedagogy and we talked about three different STEM pedagogies and you know went into them in some more detail. So one was universal design for learning. And then the, another one was project-based learning which some of you were able to connect to what Erica and Allison were speaking about today. And Erica provided a really good example in how a specific lesson design session or design challenge rather could be expanded into a month long lesson. And then the third one was um, the third one is rather a steam education. So looking at the arts with stem education. So let me go ahead and share my screen again. So, but before I started, I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, a transition when you're doing 1 thing and coming to another topic. So, I just wanted to do a small activity with all of you. So, I'm just going to go back to the reflection slide. And all of these slides are together. So, when you do look at them later on, you will have the sequence of the slides of the pedagogy and then also contextualizing the content as well as resources and STEM settings. So let's do the, um, if you remember from last time, uh, when I went uh, towards the end of the training, we did a small activity and it was called 54321. We won't spend too much time on it, but it was just to kind of get ourselves reoriented back into this topic. So think of five things. So keep your, um, you know, sit well and, you know, comfortably rather, and have your feet on the ground and think of, or look, look for five things around you. And think of four things that you hear right now. Think of three things that are that you feel on your body or that you're touching. So it could even be your feet on the ground, the clothes that you're wearing. Think of two things that you smell right now. And one thing that you taste right now. Okay, since we're not together in the same room, I, th I feel like this activity is really nice to just get us grounded virtually. All right, so hopefully we will we're all back on the same page. So I'll go through the recap one more time. All right, I see some smiley faces and thumbs up. Thank you. Thank you for those reactions. So as as I was mentioning earlier, so we in on Monday, we spoke about universal design for learning, project-based learning, and STEAM education. So STEM with the arts. Universal design for learning, we learned that it allows uh, instructors to have different tools or techniques that they can use in the classroom to make um, STEM learning much more inclusive. So not just inclusive, you know, for different genders, but also for different learning styles and different learning abilities. And that each of us actually, our learning is actually as unique as our fingerprints. So all of us in this training right now, we all learn very differently. And so sometimes we have to see visuals or we have to see, uh, we, we prefer to listen or we would prefer to um, put comments in the chat box or to provide comments orally. So however it is, accommodating different type of learning styles so that information can be processed in different ways for students. We also spoke about project-based learning and how project-based learning also helps students to connect STEM uh, subjects or concepts to their everyday life. And we saw an example from Flint, Michigan, where they were talking about the quality of the water in their, um, in their neighborhoods and how the students were investigating the quality of water. And Erica also presented a really great example today 
of the design challenge, which could also be expanded into a project based learning lesson or a part of a curriculum in STEM. And lastly, we spoke about STEAM education, so STEM with arts. And one of the reasons we, um, I separated these out, as I had mentioned on Monday, was that the arts STEM STEM by itself is, you know, it can be, um, it, it, it's uh, been known for many years as STEM, but when we started to put arts into it, which over the last five, six years has become very popular, it really helps to uh, bridge the liberal arts or languages or any other um, humanities with STEM, which is very important because STEM itself can't be learned by itself in a silo or in isolation. It really is a part of our world. And art is also a part of our world. Language is a part of our world. Um, you know, humanities is a part of our world. And so all of that really needs to be integrated. And so we looked at a couple of examples in which how art could be applied in STEM education. And I provided an example of the portraits that the students drew in India, where they use the Cartesian coordinate system as well as paint ratios to um, to represent themselves and see and so we could see how they see themselves in the world. And I went over this very briefly last time, so I just wanted to pull it up one more time before I moved on to the contextualization. And this is not a set guide or you know guidelines for problem solving. But I wanted to just summarize a lot of the information that we went over on Monday and things that you could take to a training classroom, um, you know, as you're working with students. So questions to ask and just a problem solving process for students is exploring an issue, stating what is known, defining the issues, researching the knowledge, investigating solutions and presenting and supporting the chosen solution and then reviewing a performance or reviewing what it is that you that you have developed or um, uh, data or information that you have collected. So just some ideas, and again, this is just a summary of kind of what we had spoken about last time. Okay, so now I'm going to go into contextualizing STEM content as well as contextualizing resources in STEM. And I separated these two out. The first two bullet points I'm gonna put together, which is contextualizing STEM content and also adapting to the local language and bridging language STEM in STEM. For example, bridging local language to, you know, either English or French, which is oftentimes the case in secondary as well as higher education in STEM subjects. And also contextualizing resources, which I'll present after that. So the first two I put together, and the reason is that content is, um, is often tied with language and is tied with culture and communities and your the environment. So I put both of them together and we can we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. And then the resources I separated out and we'll go over that last. And contextualizing resources is that what we were talking about earlier on Monday is that STEM it can be inclusive as well as um, you know everybody can do STEM. So it's not that just because you don't have the resources or you don't have the technology to do STEM STEM can be done anywhere. And it's um, also like that example that I showed from Sri Lanka where they took the refurbished materials and created STEM activities for students in their classrooms. So that was, um, so that's just to kind of highlight that. So we'll, we'll go through this, but first I'll talk about the first two bullet points. So contextualizing STEM content and also adapting to the local language. So here, this, this circle, wheel, however you'd like to look at it, is, is, is circular because all of these, similar to the ecosystem, what we had mentioned or we had um, spoken about earlier in this, um, in this overall presentation, is that all of these really, you know, are dependent on each other and also helped a student to learn STEM. So everything from local and traditional knowledge. And one of the reasons why I really highlight this especially as well in the you know, diverse communities that we work in, you know, even in the United States or wherever we work, we work with very diverse communities and different ways of seeing the world. And there is local and traditional knowledge in terms of how we interpret um, STEM or even math outside of a formal school system. So these are all these informal systems or informal knowledge systems that children bring to, to the classroom with them. And oftentimes the, the information, you know, it may not necessarily be accurate. It may not, you know, have this like formal language associated with it, but the concepts are there. 
So we have to work with that concept, um, those concepts that the students have and see how we can build on that. And this is very much tied to their lived experiences. So students have lots of varied lived, lived experiences. Some students have seen wells, other students have been, you know, are very close to agriculture or farms or some students are in urban areas and they see a lot of pollution. So whatever their lived experiences are, those also really tie into contextualizing any type of STEM content that's being developed or curriculum that's being developed for students. And this links to their prior knowledge. So we had spoken about prior knowledge as well and really tapping into prior knowledge, leveraging that prior knowledge that students bring to the classroom and using that in STEM, um, in STEM instruction. And then lastly, the languages that are spoken in the area or the community are also very important. And one example of this is when I was in India doing some research several years ago, I was working in a middle school and in the middle school, they were, they were doing some uh, um, very complicated work on fractions. And so you can imagine like fractions are usually taught in the third or fourth grade, but here in the seventh grade, they were doing some more complicated work on flat fractions. So you would think that the concept of fractions had, you know, was much more solid in students' um, understanding. When I was talking to a couple of the students, they didn't, they didn't realize that the word half, which they use in their local language in Hindi, was the same as the word half that they're using in their classroom. So when we were talking about languages, they said half in Hindi is ada. So if you take like, for example, a piece of bread or what they call roti in India, so they, you know, they, they're used to splitting a roti in half and they'll say, this is an ada roti for you and ada roti for me. So half a roti for you and half a roti for me. But then they didn't understand that that concept of a half related to what one half was in the classroom. And when they made that connection, they're like, oh, I use math every day in my everyday life. So really connecting for the languages, you know, from a very early age is important. So everything, you know, from even from a preschool level, making those connections and solidifying the mathematics concepts is very important. So by the time they get to middle school, they don't have to think that there is a distinction or a separation between what they're learning in school and at home, that there is no disconnect, but rather everything is connected and math and science is in their everyday lives. So I wanted to just put this, these ideas out here in terms of contextualizing the STEM content. Um, before I go to the next slide, I just wanted to check if there's any questions or reflections. Silence is also an answer, <laughs> so we don't have to, we don't have to um, reflect too much. You can be reflecting in your head and be like Albert Einstein and then, um, and a couple of months later have something to say, which is totally fine. I just wanted to say that um, the honoring that lived experience of students uh, that yes. really resonates with, with me. Um, so again, some students, the way that they've seen certain careers talked about or what's important, they may not connect with their own lived experience. And so being able to um, have that be part of the process as you're introducing activities or even doing activities of like, oh, how did you know how to do that? So that they're connecting with, oh, my mom actually does this, you know, uses this technique when she's cooking or I've seen this in sewing. Um, I just talked actually with a medical device engineer who said that for her, she worked with, um, she did sewing as a hobby and that actually helped her um, understand how flesh, <laughs> how soft tissues actually interact and was really helpful and uh, um, something that she brought, a skill she brought that other students didn't have. Um, and so context, and so bringing that piece in, I think is, is really important for students seeing the value of their lived experience and how it connects with careers. Yeah, thank you so much, Erica. That's a great example, really great example. Oh, great. I think Erica, you um, stimulated some other thoughts here. So we have, um, Justin says, it also makes me think about the gaps or separations created when the language of their lives isn't the language of their education. Very much, exactly. I 100% um, agree with that. Um, and Marbella says, I think it speaks, it speaks also to how important it is to really get to know your students in order to tap into what they bring into the classroom. So doing activities to do this is crucial. Yes, exactly. Um, and 
one of the things is that, you know, I had mentioned that I, I like to do these activities at the beginning of a class and it really does help to stimulate um, the, um, the thinking and connection to the um, to some topics. One more example, I was also thinking about early literacy. Yeah, exactly. This is a really good point, Irene, um, in, in terms of connecting um, the language, you know, when, when you're when you're actually learning how to read, it's actually the research shows that if you learn to read in your local language, the one that you speak at home because you already have oral proficiency of it, it helps you to become a better reader. And, you know, it also, of course, spills into other topics and subjects because then you understand math more concretely or science concepts more concretely. So language of instruction is definitely um, very important at the early years. And Erica says also connecting and honoring valuing the language of their lives with more technical or STEM language and vocabulary. Exactly. I completely um, agree with that, Erica. And I think that all of us are scientists, uh, you know, as well as critical thinkers, because we're constantly navigating our everyday lives and everything that's around us. But, you know, we may not necessarily have the formal language as, you know, a physicist has or an engineer has, but, you know, just thinking through how are we conceptualizing that? And just to add on to what Erica said is, you know, um, I don't know if many of you may have had similar experiences to this, but when I uh, went, uh, it was, um, I was buying something from a child on the street and usually I try not to, you know, encourage children to, um, you know, I, I, I want to encourage them, but he was very desperate to make a sale. So I was in India and he came running up to me and he wanted me to buy some incense sticks. And I said, so I said, okay, let me do a math problem with you. You know, he said he was going to give me, I think, two boxes of incense sticks for for twenty rupees, and I, and I said, you know, I actually only want fifteen, and I think there was like, you know, um, uh, sorry, there was ten in each uh, incense box. So he quickly did the calculation in his head because he was, um, and I was not trying to put him on the spot or something, but I was just, you know, sort of, you know, we got into a conversation, and I was having some. You know, uh, we were just kind of having some fun math problems going back and forth and he quickly did these conversions in his head without even thinking and he automatically gave me what what I needed for the price I wanted. And I was thinking, I was like, even without a formal education, this boy is doing um, division multiplication, you know, working with currencies. So it's, it's pretty fascinating how we're actually formalizing a lot of concepts informally without having a formal education. And it's not to say that, you know, formal education is not important. Definitely going to school and learning all the scientific concepts, mathematics concepts is important. But the fact, it's so fascinating how the brain works and how the brain is able to informally understand a lot of these concepts. Uh, Justin says, there are a lot of street sellers here. We have no education, but when they talk prices, they are quick, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's amazing, yeah, really amazing. Um, what, um, you know, uh, learning with money is very, very important. We, we do a lot of, in early math education, we do a lot of um, uh, activities with money because we find that it is very effective in teaching students math. So that's a very good example. Okay, uh, so I just wanted to go through a couple of points on the importance of contextualizing content and you can continue to reflect. Please put your thoughts in the chat box or feel free to unmute yourselves. You can keep it pretty informal. I realized I wasn't doing the full screen presentation before, so sorry if it was very small. So one of the things, uh, you know, is that just recognizing that students are not empty vessels and they do have prior knowledge when they come to the class or any type of instruction. They, they have these thought processes already and so figuring out how we can tap into that and help them to connect that is so much more, it's very, very important. And I think I had mentioned this, um, this idea that, you know, as you're learning you new information, there's only really a 10 to 15 second window in which that information can get networked to other existing information in your brain. So if you think about time. knowledge traveling on a train. Did your mother to... ask you if you want a bath? Oh, Justin, I don't know if you had a question. No. Sorry, Mike was turned on accidentally and there was background noise here. No worries. It's okay. No worries. I understand. Um, so you can kind of think of knowledge as as kind of as being on a train track and a train passing over your head. And so you have to have multiple cars passing over your head 
because there's only this small little channel or like a 10 to 15 second window in which one of the cars can go inside of your head and connect to another network in your brain to, ins or to, to ins I say institutionalize or just basically be connected to other information in your head. So if you're learning a new language or even if you're learning the equation E equals MC squared for the very first time, you probably have to hear it for 15, 20 times and see it applied in different ways in order for your brain to really create that neural network and be connected to that formula and be able to apply it. And so this is for, you know, this is what we find in children who, um, you know, I, I don't want to say, um, you know, who, who maybe who have not gone through trauma, but children who've gone through trauma and who have other, you know, mental health um, issues such as anxiety or depression, what we find is that for those students, the the number of cars that have to pass over their head or the number of times that we tell them that information is actually double. So we may have to tell them that E equals MC squared and show them multiple ways in which it's applied almost 30 or 40 times versus a child who doesn't have that anxiety or that trauma. It's just something to keep in mind and how that's why universal design for learning is so helpful because it has these different representations and different ways of expression so that if a student is in that situation, they don't necessarily have to be removed from the class. They can be in a class with their peers and still have the resources to learn and um, alongside their peers and not feel like they're falling behind because they have different representations around them. And so they're able to absorb information and um, and network, network, network rather to its different information in the brain, in their brains. So contextualizing uh, content also increases motivation and interest in STEM. So once students see the connection to their everyday lives, their language, as we've talked about, um, maybe activities that they do, then they start to say, okay, this is something that I can do and it is something that I'm interested in and I'd like to pursue. And it's something that STEM, it's, we see, they see it in their everyday lives. So just kind of connecting to um, the motivation and interest uh, it also acknowledges knowledge systems and language, and I think this was, sorry, I can't remember who said it, but there was, it was in the comment box where, you know, when we do respect knowledge systems and language of, um, of all communities, it really does help us to make broader connections as well as more deeper connections, because there is a lot of knowledge systems that, that have great scientific knowledge that are not documented or not uh, maybe have been destroyed because of colonization or, you know, other uh, industrialization processes. So it's really important to to listen and say, OK, this is the students. Th this is how the students think, or maybe even how a teacher thinks and think that, you know, how can we connect that and uh, formalize that into a STEM curriculum? It also dif uh, respects different ways of learning. So what we had mentioned, the universal design for learning, it respects, you know, each learner who is lear learning is, is unique as a, their fingerprint. And lastly, I, you know, I, this is something that I've, I've done some research on when I was working on my PhD, but I just wanted to address it briefly is that it also addresses issues of systemic racism, class inequalities and other inequalities students face in STEM. And yesterday I was asked to speak to um, a delegation of uh, academics from Iraq and one of the questions they asked me was, why did I go into STEM when I was a kid or when I was you know, studying rather? And I told them that actually until probably the seventh or eighth grade, I wanted to be a journalist or a writer. I, I always thought I would be in the language arts. I never saw myself in STEM until in the eighth grade, I learned about Marie Curie. And I said, oh, here's like an amazing woman who has done so much in STEM and contributed to the field of chemistry. And that's, and I've always been really good at math and science, but I never, thought that I could be in the field and really seeing my uh, seeing a representation, a woman in the field really helped me to connect to um, the, you know, the, the field even more. And that's when I, in high school, I took a lot more math and science classes and I, I wanted to be Marie Curie at some point, but then, you know, I, I, I you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to be the best you instead, but, um, but it was a really nice inspiration. And I think that Seeing that representation is really, really important, you know, and I think it'll start to address, I know, um, you know, certain, you know, communities or students feeling like they don't have a participation or a role in STEM. Any thoughts or reflections on this before we move on?
Okay, great. And feel free to keep typing in the chat box. I can see the chats as they come through. So I wanted to speak about informal knowledge. And we, you know, we've talked kind of about this with the connection to contextualizing STEM education. And the reason why informal knowledge is so important is that it doesn't stop when a child starts going to school, like in kindergarten or first grade. Informal knowledge continues to develop for the student outside of the school. And so you would find, you know, a student that's in middle school, high school, college, or even adults to have misconceptions about STEM because that informal knowledge may not have been formalized. But even those misconceptions may not be misconceptions, but they're just the way that they see the world. And so as we're thinking about our STEM curriculum and we're thinking about making it much more inclusive and, you know, developing these after school or extracurricular programs for students, this is an opportunity for us to really tap into this informal knowledge and see how students can explore it more because sometimes from the informal knowledge, it leads to a lot of creative um, innovations and other thinking, critical thinking that we may not know um, that the regular classroom rather doesn't give an opportunity for. So informal knowledge, um, so this is, act, sorry. So I'm gonna, uh, these are actually a couple of points from a paper that I had written uh, two years back. And so I, I'm just gonna put a couple of evidence points down here. So when we make connections from formal to informal knowledge, we notice that students do better academically in school. And we see this particularly in STEM fields. Um, connections also provide a way for curriculum developers and teachers to validate and recognize that children come, what, what children come to school with. And so this builds on the idea of prior knowledge, the lived experiences, languages, um, you know, anything that they, that's in their environment, what they come to school with. So as we're developing curriculum, it allows us to say, okay, we're validating that information. It may not necessarily be correct, uh, you know, according to the formal scientific uh, concepts, but it's something that we can work with. And it's not, it's not that we're um, dismissing it. So the child feels just uh, not motivated or interested in STEM. And the recognition of informal knowledge helps make STEM relevant to children's lives. So we're, you know, the connection to the everyday lives, which can increase motivation and interest. And this is the paper that, um, that I've written. If you'd like, I can give you a copy of it as well. But just to kind of give a couple of more um, evidence-based reasons why informal knowledge, building on prior knowledge, lived experiences, et cetera, is very important. Okay, so now I'm just going to ask if there's any other reflection points or reflections, thoughts, questions before I move on to contextualizing materials. Okay, I know I went through quite a bit of information um, in the last few slides, and uh, some of it is quite theoretical, so just if you have any questions, feel free to ask, but I think the most important takeaway from the last few slides is to really think about the prior knowledge that students bring to the classroom and the prior knowledge is really linked to informal experiences or lived experiences that the students have in their, um, in their communities, environments, families, and that's what really helps them to bridge information that they bring to any type of learning with. Hey, Marbella, I see some chat questions. I, I'm happy to share the paper. Um, Indramani, I'm, I'm happy to share the paper with everybody. Marbella asks, are there any particular strategies you use to get more input on what type of informal knowledge students have? Yeah, so I, the, the best way to actually do this is through the needs assessment. And Peter talked about, Peter Weinberger talked about needs assessments last or two weeks back. And um, that's it's a really good opportunity to find out, you know, what is the um, what 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 is in the community? What do students already know? And then even when students come to the classroom, you can have a formative assessment. And formative assessments um, are basically like just kind of doing a knowledge check at the beginning of the of the program to see where students are, kind of like a pretest. It's like, what do you think about this concept? And you know, how would you define it? And I think the 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 way when you um, when you develop these tests, it's very important to have different ways of expressing the students, allowing them to express themselves differently. So it's not like a formal test, but rather 
they can talk about it with their peers or they can write it down or they can draw a you know a diagram or whatever it they're you know whatever it is they would like to do but that really helps them to um uh, it really helps teachers rather to see where they stand before they move on in a lesson i think that's the best way to do it but the needs assessment is actually probably the the most important thing because it also assesses what is already in the community the resources in the community the parents knowledge their education um, you know, how certain scientific ideas are communicated in society or in that community. I hope that helps Marbella. I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that later as well. Okay, you're welcome. One more. And Erica says, informally during activities, you can also observe what students do and what language they use. So having a way to observe and record at this as students discuss in small groups and collaborate and work with concepts. Yeah, that's a really good point, Erica. And, you know, at this, this kind of goes through the uh, formative assessments and there are some examples of formative assessments in the STEM toolkit that you can look at, but definitely having these kind of regular check ins or observations of students. Um, you know, what type of language are they using? How are they explaining different concepts? Um, is the best is and having an observation sheet to record. This is important. It's a great point. Thank you, Erica. Okay. Right, so, oops, sorry. So, this is also in the STEM toolkit um, and 1 of the reasons why um, we put this in here or put it in the toolkit and I also wanted to talk about it was that oftentimes we take a look at a lesson plan or we take a look at, you know, a certain idea for STEM and we think, oh, maybe it wouldn't apply to this community or it's very difficult to implement in this community because they don't have different resources. And I just wanted to show some examples. These are actually example, examples from our STEM toolkit in which certain um, materials can be can have different alternatives. And, and it's not necessarily limited to these uh, materials, but you can also be creative and, you know, you can use other resources, but just to kind of you know, put some ideas in your head um, in terms of what can be um, interchangeable. For example, um, straws can be interchangeable with sticks if it works out. Um, you know, tissue paper with newspaper. Uh, coffee filters can also be um, interchanged with newspaper, notebook paper, leaves, napkins, paper towels. And um, on this side, plastic, paper or plastic cups you know, can be um, interchanged with jars, cardboard boxes, plastic containers, cans, and uh, string paper clips, rubber bands, you know, and those like the pipe twisters or the pipe cleaners or twisters, tie twisters, um, can be interchanged with twine, wire, clothes, or hangers. And some of my work when I was, I presented a couple of slides on Monday, my work in India, and a lot of these materials were not available in the communities that we were working with. And it was, there was, you know, we didn't want to get it shipped some from somewhere, somewhere else. So we really looked at, you know, local resources that we could use. And even the example from Sri Lanka, where they refurbished a lot of information, a lot of materials rather in their community to create STEM um, resources. So there's different ways of kind of approaching it. So never think that it is not possible. And if it is, if, if it's a question that you have, you know, you can always reach out to us and hopefully we can brainstorm ideas or we can connect you with other partners or, um, you know, organizations that are working on, you know, similar issues and they can also give you ideas as well. Okay, there are a couple of comments in the chat. I want to take a look at this. Okay, so Indramani says that mostly the problem is not, a, is not allowing students to engage themselves while connecting the problem with their prior knowledge. Okay, uh, Indramani, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you think about that. Um, and Marbella says, I think this goes back to the point made in the previous session about focusing more on function versus specific material themselves. Exactly, Marbella. Exactly. That's that's a very good point. And the whole thing about contextualizing information and using alternative materials or local materials is about that. Exactly. And it goes to, I think it was the the third or fourth slide that I put up on Monday, which is that regardless of the resources that are available in your community, um, what we're really building on is um, making STEM education inclusive, as well as making sure that students feel welcome. So their social and emotional well-being 
is um, is also uh, addressed as well, and they feel like their their knowledge and um, who they are is being represented. That's an excellent point, point Marbella. And um, Indramani, if you could el elaborate a little bit more on your point, I would love to hear a little bit more about that. So this is actually my last slide, so we can keep okay, a back. Most, yes, mostly what, 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 what I have experienced in, in the context of Nepal, that uh, in the name of engaging students in activities, what we have seen is that uh, the students are not allowed to engage sufficiently so that they connect the existing problem with their prior knowledge. They can't get sufficient time to play with those ideas they have brought informally from their um, uh, experiences, uh, I would say. Yeah? So because of that, what it happens, uh, the teacher uh, suddenly uh, actually jump into another activity, another state, and they could not connect those ideas with the problem. And they, the students actually uh, just uh, are lost where to go and what to do. That's what actually happens because uh, I'm also uh, uh, going through my graduate students who are actually doing their intensive programs. Mm -hmm. uh, when they use design thinking in the first stage of that uh, uh, design thinking, they, uh, I have found teachers uh, in hurry. Yeah, they, they, they do not engage themselves at that first stage. Because of that, the result, uh, they, the outcome they want uh, are not expected, uh, uh, are not uh, as expected. That's why this is the crucial stage where students should be allowed to engage uh, themselves so that they connect uh, the problem with the prior knowledge and uh, start uh, raising the question, what's this and how can I actually move ahead? That's what I have felt in my experience. Thank you, thank yeah. you, Tita. No, of course, and thank you, Nirmani, for sharing that. And I, I think that it, that is a very, um, that is a very good concern because oftentimes the time on task or the time that we have in the classroom doesn't allow for activities and it doesn't allow for exploration and allow teachers to, to be able to connect prior knowledge and also the size of the classrooms. I've been to a few schools in Nepal and I know that the size of the classrooms is quite large. And even in some of my other work, you know, uh, for example, when I was in Malawi, seeing 200 students in a classroom for one teacher it doesn't, you know, some of these strategies, it doesn't allow for it. But I think that, you know, it's, um, you know, with with our programs, luckily, with the STEM toolkit and the STEM work that we're doing, that once I'll, I'll let you answer. Um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me speak for a while. When I ask the teachers why actually they are doing, their only one issue is that uh, if I allow students uh, most time, then it is quite difficult to uh, finish the course. That's why they are always <laughs> in hurry uh, <laughs> to, to, to escape that uh, uh, lesson, whether the students have understood or not, it doesn't matter, but they want to finish the course. That is the main problem that we have seen here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that, no, that's okay. That's a good point as well. I think that, yeah, it's, you know, there's so many other things to do, so <laughs> you need to finish things quickly. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that, those are really good points. And I, I do agree that in the formal education system, that the, the time that is available for certain topics, you know, I, I know that when I was doing research in Cambodia as well, it was 30 minutes in a math lesson. And so by the time the teacher, had, the teacher also do, had to do a health checkup. So I had to check everybody's nails and, you know, make sure the hands are clean. And before she could start or here, she it was mainly women, but could, they could start the um, the math lesson. And I was just, you know, looking that when I was doing the time and task research, I was like, okay, that took 10 minutes. Now there's only 20 minutes for the delivery of the lesson. And in that time, you know, she had so much to do. Um, so I completely agree that it can be challenging, but I do want to say one of the advantages of, of the work that we're doing through the STEM toolkit 
and you know the the work that we're doing with all the all of the partners here is that it allows for um, time out, outside of the regular classroom. So extracurricular activities or STEM corners or after school programs where students really do have that time to do a little bit more hands on exploration, that experiential learning that that you know that we would want in the classroom, but oftentimes it's not there. And even when I was working in the United States, I when I finished my um, Sorry, when I was working on my PhD, I was working with schools in the in the um, in Maryland, in the public schools in Maryland, the neighborhood of um, the backyard rather of the University of Maryland, and you know some of the schools were quite low income. And one of the things that we realized is that you know just having these after school activities, and I was that's what I was working on after school activities. It just motivated students so much more to learn in the classroom, and the, and then even the teachers. Who saw the activities we were doing in the classroom could reference it. They said, oh, remember, you saw the University of Maryland, you know, students who did this and then they could reference it in the classroom. And I think that even those small connections really help the students to kind of build on that knowledge and then they start connecting it, you know, to their everyday lives as well. Yeah, those are really good points in their money. Thank you. Erica, did you have a question? Just going to say that, um. There's a lot of quick ways to do it as well to incorporate a little bit of reflection. And I think that early in my career, I was like, let's do, do, do and build, build, build. And then seeing the power of even having the students, even for a moment at the end of, of a session, write down um, a question they have or write down a reflection on the concepts or a connection that they're making between those concepts and something else that they've learned or known. Um, that even doing that helps to sort of solidify and focus them. Um, on those concepts and allow for a little bit of that time, right? And if they then have a moment to share with someone sitting next to them um, and just even do that um, where there's peer-to-peer -peer sharing and those opportunities that it can allow for some of that reflection even with a class of 200 students, right? Write it down, think for a second, write it down, talk to someone next to you and you've now made a connection with someone else in the room and some prior prior knowledge. Yeah, that's a really good point, Eric. I think that um, definitely that's multiple means of expression under UDL that we went over. And, you know, when I was in Malawi, actually, I did see one classroom where a teacher, he was able to control. I mean, he had such good control over his 200 students and he did a think pair share activity where he snapped his fingers, clapped his hands, said something at Chichewa and all of a sudden all the students got into pairs and they started sharing information. So it is possible, but it also has the capacity of the teacher also has to be there too, like their, you know, their training and, you know, their ability to do that, which we can't put on all teachers, but, you know, but he was, he was an amazing teacher. So, yeah, and even just establishing some of those norms, right? So even if you introduce one, one thing like that, and it takes them a while to get in the habit, but then they're in the habit, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. Okay. Um, Oh, I think you've also put it in the same thing, a flipped classroom. Do you want to talk about that too? Yeah, just that um, I have a few who have done research and uh, worked with work with uh, university and college professors on flipped classroom models, where a reading, you know, getting that information of reading and, and watching lectures happens outside as homework. And then the class time is actually spent on discussion and reflection and digesting um, and and those more active processing activities and reflection activities. Um, so I know that that takes sometimes intensive work to change a model within a university, um, but even being able to try it or test it with one educator in one classroom in one class is a way to start um, um, and show efficacy for others. Yeah, that's it's a good um, example as well. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that, you know, just to sort of summarize the, you know, when we when we spoke about universal design for learning, I think it provides the the cast framework provides really good examples. For all different resource communities to to try multiple means of representation, even if it's having lots of number charts or, um, you know, scientific concepts posted on the wall that really does help students start to make connections between what is being told to them. And then they can see it on the wall or if it's being pointed to add at the wall. So even those very simple ideas or concepts are so important. And it's, you know, it's sometimes it's not intuitive for us as educators or teachers, because, you know, we also tend to teach the way that the way that we've been taught or we, we think, oh, we already know this information. And, you know, I, um, even when I teach students, like I do some 
community work on math tutoring. And when I'm teaching students, I'm like, I'm like, how come you don't know this? And then I have to step back for a second because it's information that I know. And it's so it's, um, and they're learning it for the very first time. So just kind of thinking about that rail car going over somebody's head. And there's really only that 10 to 15 second window for it to be networked with other um, information in their head. But um, just, you know, I think the UDL um, cast information is, is really fantastic. They've got some great videos. They also have a course that you can take if you're interested. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I will share, all, you'll have all this information in the PowerPoint. You can also feel free to reach out to me if you have any other questions about the pedagogy or, um, you know, contextualizing information or materials. And I'm just going to check the chat for a second. Yeah, Marbella says the expert blind spots we might have. Exactly, exactly. You know, I feel like even when I'm giving a presentation to colleagues or peers like you, I, I feel like sometimes I have blind spots too. And then I'm like, hold on a second. They don't know what I did yesterday. Okay, let me explain what I did yesterday. So it's not that you're um, in my schedule every single day. So I have to explain that as well. All right, I see Haley come on. So I'll let her wrap up. Thank you everybody for your time today.